What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. I wanted to just throw this in in the beginning. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. That really helps our numbers. Also, check out the merch store at brennantcomedy.com slash merch store to get your ex-drinking buddy merch. And if you really want to, subscribe on Patreon, patreon.com slash brennantassif. That really helps me out. Um, I'm so happy uh, to have everybody who listens. And thank you so much. Enjoy the episode. Grab me a beer and grab me a coat. We about to sit for an hour bullshit and tell jokes. And please don't mix it up because he didn't sober up. Brandon T. Comedy on your social media feeds. And Brandon Tess here, bitch, your ex drink your buddy. Brandon Tess here, bitch, your ex drink your buddy. Brandon Tess here, bitch, your ex drink your buddy. What's up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of Brennan Tassif is your ex drinking buddy. I'm your host, Brennan Tassif. If you're new to the program, quick rundown of the show. I used to be everyone's favorite drinking buddy. It was my favorite thing to do. Hang out with friends, get drunk, do drugs, get in all sorts of trouble and reminisce about old stories. I am sober now, but that is still one of my favorite things to do. Hang out with the guest and reminisce about the good old days. Most weeks I will be joined by a guest. This week is no exception. All the way from the BK, Gastor Almonte. <laughs> I appreciate that you still channel drinking buddy energy. Oh, yeah. That's dope. I was like, when, <laughs> yeah, he just got drunk right now. Like, in per- I just saw it happen. That was amazing. <laughs> when I did this with Dan the very first time, because we were just getting to know each other, it was a few months after I moved here. And he goes, you really are an ex-drinking buddy. Like, you don't drink, but... But whenever anybody's around you, you're like, let's fucking go. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm Real hyped. Talk. Yo, he got me a coffee before the show, but he was like, you got to chug that shit. Yeah, let's Hell yeah. do it. <laughs> It'll zip in your step. Plug everything up front. Um, for everyone listening, you are a comedian based here in New York City. Let everybody know where they can find you, all the stuff on social media, YouTube, anything like that. Oh, dope. Yeah, you can find me on all social media uh, using my name, at Gastor Almonte, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever it is. I'm on there. And I have a dope weekly podcast called The War Report. Um, it's hosted by myself and the homie Shalay with Sharp. Um, we Shouts literally out. shoot the shit every uh, week. And uh, we cover topics, and also you get to hear about our lives and our nonsense. Uh, so, yeah, it's like this. Just we're not uh, – we still drink, essentially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is also the funny thing about the show is everyone's always like, oh, well, like, I'm not sober. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like, come on. Because <laughs> the whole premise of the show was – is what I was just saying. It's, you know, I had crazy shit happen, so I had to get sober. Yeah. But it's also like – What I realized is every time I talk to somebody and I'm always like, oh, yeah, this one time I got so drunk, I put my head through a guy's car window because he was flirting with my sister. (laughs) And then without fail, people always go, well, that's psychotic. But this one time I got so drunk and I was like, oh, that's the show. Like, that's that's the show because everybody's got and you were nice enough. You sent me a list of yours. So we're going to get into that. But before we do that. You are a comedian up here in New York. We were talking about it before, and we've talked about it at the stand quite a few times. Based out of Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've talked about it. And not just based, by the way, to be clear. I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I want to clarify. Yeah. A yeah. lot of people base BK. I'm from BK. Yeah. But yeah. You're back from when it was Biggie's Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. Very much so. Um, but how did you get into growing up in that kind of environment, being from up here, how did you get into uh, comedy? Like, how did you get into stand up as an art form? Just because you do that full time. Yeah, that's, yeah, man. That's what you do. And you've been on This Is Not Happening and you've been on television and everything. And how did that how did that happen coming from a guy who grew up in BK? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, growing up, I was always one of like the, you know, back of the bus funny dudes with yeah. my crew. Um, but I didn't know comedy. I didn't view that as like a job you could do unless you were like. You know, Eddie Murphy, Chris, Chris Rock, Rock. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? I didn't know that, like, you could make a hundred grand as a comedian. Like, it could be a, just a pretty good job. Yeah. So that, ne- so it never occurred to me to go after that. Uh, I actually had, like, a sales manager job. I used to, like, uh, I started out selling uh, potato chips on a route truck for Frito-Lay. No, okay. Got promoted to manager. And when, how old were you when this was happening? Um, I was, uh, what is this, 24? Yeah. 
24, 25, okay. and I did that until like my late 20s. So up until 24, 25, you were just kind of the funny guy in your group of friends. Like you were always making people laugh, and then you just went and got like a, a job, and you yeah. were just doing the thing. I got into sales like most charming people yeah. do essentially that slacked off Everybody of school. Everybody I ever meet <laughs> that's in sales, when they hang out with me or most comics, they always go, you should do sales. You crush that yeah. shit, because that's all it is. It's bonding with people, making them feel good, and then like offering a legit solution. That's yeah. really it. Making people comfortable. Yeah, because they need to be comfortable enough to tell you the real. Like, yeah. this is the part of my business is trash, and be confident that you're giving them a real answer, not just, like, you know, trying to hustle them. Yeah, because we have to do the same thing on stage. Everybody yeah. knows, like, we have to, within the first 30 seconds, we have to convince the entire group of strangers, like, hey, we're going to have a good time. Like, trust me. Like, yeah. I know what I'm doing. Amen. Exactly. So, yeah, I did that uh, when I got promoted. Uh, I realized that, like, uh the way that I sold was super informal, like because I was on like a route selling on selling to like bodega owners. You yeah, know? that was my I was I was crushing that. Like I grew up in Brooklyn in New York, so so you know how to yeah, yeah. that I was good. But like with the promotion, I knew I'd be like uh, selling to like uh, district managers dealing from, with like, corporate you know, people. Yeah. yeah, so I took I read an article in Inc. Magazine about a bunch of CEOs that took a comedy class. To get better at presenting. Oh, oh get the fuck out Straight of Straight up. Like, That's how you got into it. Yeah, like I read that the week I got promoted. So I looked up a comedy class. I convinced my cousin who was a teacher to take the class with me. And we took a class. Seven and weeks. how old were you when this happened? This was uh, 28, 29 in okay. that ballpark. Um, yeah, and we took the class seven weeks later. Did a, did a set. And it went really well. Uh and uh, yeah, during the class show, like this uh, this black dude came up to me. He's like, "Yo, that shit was fire! How long you been doing comedy for?" And I'm like, seven weeks." Yeah, you know. <laughs> so he like gives me this head nod. That's like that's dope. And I'm thinking it's one of my cousin's peoples, you know, because everyone else in the class was white. So like the class show, I'm thinking, all right, if you like one, if you if you a black dude, I'm assuming it's either me or his people. Yeah. So like I asked him about it. He's like, "Nah, I don't know who that was." Um, and the dude comes up to me after the like the show when we kicking it out front. And he's like, yo, you should do this for a living. I'm a comic, and I'm actually in the main room upstairs. He was, we this is at Gotham. Oh, he just came down to check it yeah, out. Yeah, he just came out to shoot the shit at the like the downstairs room at Gotham. And um, he's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a I'm a comic. I've been doing this for ten years. Um, he's like, admittedly, you won't make the same money for a while, but if you do this, I think it could be something you do. Um, so I didn't know who he was. I go home, I Google him, and it was like Roy Wood Jr. <laughs> you know? So like, you got so like you know. <laughs> That's how little, like, I knew of comedy. Like, Holy shit. Yeah, and this is, like, <laughs> this is right when he's, like, popping off. You yeah. know, like, uh. I this, love Roy, man. Yo. I just posted the other, like, it was a couple weeks ago. I used to see Roy all the time when he'd come into Jacksonville, man. Roy's one of my favorites. He's a, he's a dope dude, super genuine. Um, And, yo, he just gave me his math. He's like, yo, anytime you want, reach out to me if you got questions. And uh, legit, still didn't do comedy for, like, a whole year after that. Okay. um, Got into, like, uh. Got in like a big funk at work. Really wasn't happy with the the work life balance. And was like, it was it the fact that you were now dealing with like more corporate people, or was it like more hours because the promotion? More hours. Yeah. Um, also, the location was further away from home. The initial gig was like ten minutes from my house. This was like an hour away. Yeah. Um. So like all of that and the the travel too, it just didn't vibe with me. Um. Also, the market. I got moved from working in Brooklyn and Queens primarily to. Like white plane, so I didn't oh. even connect with that demo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I I got into like a real argument with my wife. Like we was like going at it because I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this shit no more. Um, and she's like, like she's like, so when was the last time you were happy? And I was like, a year ago at that fucking show. Really? Straight up, just like instinctively, I was like, a year ago at that fucking. show. You could show. pinpoint it. That's yeah. When you I was the last like, time. that's the last time I had a good time. And I like felt relaxed, yeah, because it was right before the promotion. I took the class specifically for that, yeah. So she's like, "Why don't you do that more often?" I was like, "I don't know. I don't know how it works." She's like, and we sat there, looked it up. She's like, "It's People such do open a mics. crazy thing, straight up." Where it's like, because I have no idea how this works. Like mm -hmm. that's what, like this one man, this one man show I'm working on is like the same thing. It's yeah, like, a bunch of comics were like, "You should try it with your style. That would work." And I'm like, I have no fucking idea how to do this. Yeah, and then you just look it up and you meet people and you work it out, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're like, "You're doing the thing. I'm doing it. That's it." Like I had to do a budget the other day, and I was like, "Oh, we're actually this is happening now." Yeah, <laughs> like we're in it. So you did the same thing. You sat down with your wife, you looked up open mics, and you just started in. And that was it. And literally, we did it for like a week. 
And I was like, I feel better. And she's like, quit your job. Oh, really? Yeah. Ride so, or die, man. Yo. And Shout she's like, quit out. your job. Um, we'll figure the work thing out later. Just do this for now. It'll make you sane again. You'll be yourself. And for a whole year, I just did nothing but open mics. Um, thankfully, I own my building. I got tenants. So, like, we had to, like, buckle up. But bills got paid. Yeah. And then. uh, So, when you um decided to take the year to just do comedy. Yeah. And you kind of went all in on it. Were you, like, what's going What's going? Because you, like you said, you own the building, so you do have a source of income. Were you panicked? Were you worried, or were you just like, no, this is like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Um, I wasn't thinking about like career or anything. I was okay. just thinking about I need to feel normal. Oh, and I wanted to ask. So with the work thing, was that affect? Obviously, you said you were in a fight with your wife, so obviously it was affecting things at home. But was it? Because I run into this in the service industry. Because the managers yeah. in the service industry get run ragged. Right. So it's like you don't. This is your life. Is right. What you're doing. Yeah. So was that in your situation getting promoted to the management and sales? Was that just like you didn't have time for like anything else? That was just your life now. Literally, because it's it's, it's miserable. It's, you know what I mean? Like sales is dope if you have uh, no other options and you need to make a lot of money. Because it's good it's money. Great. Quick. Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing in the service industry. You exactly. Get, get, make good money quick. And on top of that, like I will say that like I think it's important for everyone to do it for a short term. You learn a valuable skill. I think every job requires sales. Yeah. So I do think it's important to do it for a bit. Well, we see it all the time now. We run into open micers and they're like, "How are you meeting all these people?" It's like because I'm t- like I talk to them. Like, yeah. It's not that hard. That, but th- it is though. But these are yeah, especially if you come up where a lot of your life is not. And I don't want to be old man get off my lawn, but like a lot of your life is based in social media and the internet. Then you go to school, you get out of school, you get a job in the field that you went to school for. You've never had to sell yourself. You've never had to interact with other people. And I grew up in a house where my dad did like old school sales, like in the eighties, like yeah. whining and dining, and so he like taught us like reality is perception. Like this is how we do it. And so I've always been really good with people. That shit matters. Like, yeah. literally, uh, while raising my kids, anytime they wanted to buy something, I made them convince me of it. Yeah, and that's such a unique and incredibly important skill. Yeah. So you decide, and so you already have a leg up on a lot of people when you start doing the open mics because you already know how to talk to people. Right. So after that first year, was it, because I, I know I've talked about this before with everyone listening, but my first year in New York, it was such peaks and valleys. Like I would go, I, I joke about it, but like I would go from recording a podcast with like a comic who's like in in New York comedy, and he's yeah. showing me texts from like famous people. Like, can you believe this guy? Look what he's texting me. <laughs> right, and I'm right, like, right. I'm one degree of separation away from these famous people. And then I go to work that night, and I'm getting yelled at it about a, about a steak temperature, and I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Hell yeah! Like that's New York, baby. Yeah. So for you, when you're doing the open mics, did you because you had the the building and your wife was on board and everything was kind of copacetic? Were you very like steady, or was it still like peaks and valleys, like a lot of people go through? I mean, I I think that uh I avoided the emotional aspect of. Um, you know, having a slow week or a busy week or an exciting thing, um, because I wasn't viewing it as like, this is my dream. Okay. I was viewing it as like, I'm getting back to base of like my head. I yeah. need to be normal. I need to be a happy dude in general. I want to be a good father at home. And I felt like my job ruined that. Like yeah. I, I lost be I wasn't being myself. Um, and I feel that it was bleeding into the other aspects of my life. So, my goal wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna buy, I'm about to blow up as a comic. It was, I'm learning how to express myself, and it just happens to be that I'm doing it in front of people. Yeah. But I'm learning how to understand how I feel and how to communicate that. And it just so happens that I do it on stage first. But now I could take that home to my wife. I could take that with myself and like better process how I'm feeling when I'm angry and channel it and accept it and then uh, address it. So. I didn't feel the same peaks and valleys that I hear a lot of a lot of other people feel because of that. And then the other component you mentioned, I, I, my bills were paid. Yeah, so there's like, not. You got, yeah. yeah, like young comics, like I feel for you, dude. Like you paying fourteen hundred rent and you paying ten dollars a day to perform at two open mics. You working a minimum wage job. I like, I I'm so I say it all the time, and I know you and I have talked about this, but I am so grateful at how everything worked out because I've been in the service industry for so long. Like I was able to get a job at this nice place 
yeah. to where I I can work three days a week and I don't have to worry about anything. That shit is clutch. And it's at night. So I can do the podcast. I can do all sorts of stuff during the day. I can hit like the one o'clock, two o'clock mics if I want to and then go into work. Some of these comics I meet and they're like, oh, I can only do mics on Wednesday because I have to work six days a week in order to pay rent. It's like a, it's a very like a, a gift of the Magi. It's like you, you saved all this money to move to New York to pursue comedy, but now you're living in New York where it's so expensive you can't do comedy. Yeah. It's like that. And I feel for those comics. And it's one of those things, too, where it's like, yeah, there, when there's a lot less stress, like. For me, because I'm so emotionally invested, obviously everything's a big, it's a, it hits harder. But for you, and I've heard this from so many comics that they were like, well, when I just either stopped giving a shit or just wanted to do what I wanted to do or I started doing comedy for myself, that's when everything started happening. Yeah. When you try to force it, the audience can feel that and they, they don't want any part of it. Right. So for you, because you were just kind of like going after it almost as like a, like a therapy kind of, not your comedy in a sense, but as a sense of like getting back to normal. Did you find that it, things started happening and you were just kind of like, what is that going on? Yeah, I mean, I think people were, like, interested pretty early on. Um, I think that uh, I realized I was getting asked to do uh, shows that, in my opinion, I wasn't always ready for. Yeah. Um, the This Is Not Happening thing happened. The first time I was on it, I was only three years in the comedy. How did that happen? Um, I uh, Was that when your boy Roy was hosting? Uh, the he, I did that show as well, but uh, the first season was uh, Ari's Regardless. last. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was just like a nice chain of events. I uh, I I was starting to do storytelling shows, um, so I realized that uh, I had a, a natural knack for that as well. So you found your voice pretty quickly too, because now, well, I've seen you on stage before, and you're very much like you tell stories and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, I, and I think shortened, that, but it's very much that yeah, style. And I think that comes from the fact that like my reason for being on stage was different, right? Like I was trying to like learn how to express myself yep. and understand what I was thinking. Um, yeah, so. that, I didn't even think about that. So you don't have these people in your head like, you got to do this. You got to you set a punch, set a punch. Yeah, I, I didn't make, give make, a shit make, about it. Like, I don't fucking care. Yeah, like if, if I bomb, I'm up here they, for me. I don't yeah, give like a this shit. is something I need. So like um, that stuff came in like afterward when I was like, okay, now, um, now I'm figuring out what I want to say. I could do that. And also just being frank, like I was older than other comics. Yeah. You know, I was like 29. I have, I've lived. Like, More I life got a wife. I got yeah. kids. Like I have stuff to talk about. So like. Um, I might not have been funny right away, but I was interesting right away. If I have to hear one more fucking thing about the dating apps, I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, like all that shit just bores me. Like, and there's some comic, like established comics too, who are like, yeah, I live at home. Like, yeah, that's weird. Like my mom made me dinner the other night and I was like, what the, like, I'm obviously, that's just like something I'm making up. But like, there are people who do premises like that. And I'm like, what? Like I've. I've been on my own since I was 17. Like I've been arrested eight times. Like I've like I've gone to hospitals and rehabs. It's like, what are you you're talking about your mom making you dino nuggets? Like, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah, here? I, I don't know. I, and just like for adulthood sake. Because it's a room full of millennials who <laughs> still live at home. Hey man, that's cool. Like, rock on. If that's if yeah. that's you and uh But I'm always in the back, like, what is happening? Yeah, it, it ain't for me, B. I don't know. <laughs> do that. Rock on. You you do your cookie jokes, but uh <laughs> I don't want no parts of that. So you get you, you get on stage and you you find your voice quickly because that's your whole purpose is to figure out what you want to say. Yeah. And then how, with the you do a couple of storytelling shows and then how does the this is not happening happen? Yeah, like uh, essentially, um, I started doing these like long form stories that were funny. So I'd like do them at like uh, some stand up shows after working on these story shows. And uh, my boy uh, Jeff Zimmerman used to have a show at a. Uh, at the old UCB East, okay. and uh, it was like a mixture of stand-up and story. So he had me do a long-form story there, and the stand-up that he booked that day was uh, Janelle James. And she heard my story, and she's like, yo, um, Ari is uh, doing this show, and he's looking for so uh, just stories. Like that. Yeah, so she just happened to hear it. She's like, I think what you did is a good fit. And, you know, she said, you know, uh, reach out to them. And that was it. It was literally that. Um, she sent me a screenshot of his uh, Facebook page. Because they were friends, obviously. I, I don't know. I didn't know Ari, and uh, Ari had just posted that, "Hey, I'm shooting season three. and you know, like he made like a joke. He's like, "Admittedly, too many white guys. Like, I need more uh, black uh, people of color and uh, women." And uh, so I reached out, sent the email blind, and I got a, a email response within like an hour. Get out of here! Yeah, from like uh, 
from one of his like the show producers yeah. and like it was and like you got to understand like I'm coming from corporate America I'm emailing and you're 3 years in yeah I'm like, 3 let's years not in like that. all of this is weird to me right I'm 3 years in I'm emailing a comedy central official email and Oh, yeah, because this is back. Well, yeah, because right. it was, started with Comedy, Comedy Central. Central. Yeah. So, like, I'm emailing a company a submission. So, I sent, like, a super formal, hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. This is what I do. And, like. This the, is what we learned in the promotion. Yeah, that's what I learned in my jobs. That's how, you know, that's how you handle. And the response I got was, like, yo, this is so fucking dope. <laughs> Who the fuck are you? Where you been? Like, it was super, like, casual and, like. All of that was like awesome to me. That yeah. like uh, they were just more concerned with being genuine and like that they enjoyed it. Um, and they told me right away, like, "Hey, listen, we love the story. Admittedly, like, um, we're gonna try to squeeze you in because I, I understood I was unrepped. Um, you know, I, I was unknown. I was unknown. I was a late submission because this was already towards the end of the the like booking that he was trying to find uh, yeah. some diversity stories. Um, so they like we kind of talked back and forth. They asked me to do a few more versions of it. I sent in, I would work it every couple of days, send in a new, like, uh, version of it. It's hard as hell to find a a 15-minute set in yeah. New York to tell a story, Yeah, you know. Every, Where were you? Were you just reaching out to in. friends? Or? Yeah, literally. I just hit up friends like, yo, uh, this is weird, but I need a spot for 15 minutes, and I'm going to tell one long story, probably derail your show. You know, like, <laughs> I don't know what to tell but you. But it's important. But it's, it's for important. a big thing. It's for a big thing that I can't tell you about. Like, none of it makes sense, yeah. you know? God, I love this business. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, thankfully, comedians kind of understand. We got, like, uh, uh, a far better community than, than people give us credit yeah, for. Yeah, me and Maddie Wiener talk about that. We've talked about it on her episode. But it's, it's an independent thing because you're on stage by yourself and you're vulnerable and it's just you. But the community that surrounds you is very tight. It's very loving. Side tangent. Yo, I met her at QED. Yeah. Like two weeks after she moved up here, right? Yeah. Love what she did on stage. Crush. I was like, I don't know who the fuck you are. You're awesome. And then she tells me she's like 22. Blow yeah. my mind. She's like a little. I'm like, how long you been doing this for? Like, a, she's, a, she's a kid. Yeah. Like, crushing this shit. Uh, I get an email to do like a Comedy Central taping. Um, I'm like stress writing it. I show up. She's taping her first set the same day. Yep. So like I got to watch like this person that like I met. I I enjoyed. I fell in love with her art form. And then I got to watch her as a really young, talented comic have her first like moment to shine. I got teary eyed backstage. It's one of my favorite things about this show is I will have comics on because I love I love comedy. So I have other artists on and stuff too. But it's mostly comics because I hang out with comics <clears throat> and I say it all the time. It's like watching a child grow Dope. like you'll have someone on the show and they're talking about how they started and some of this, you know, trouble they got into when they were younger and stuff. And then you're like, I really like what this person does. And then, oh. you know, a couple weeks later, they get past it, some clubs and you're like, man, I I was it's almost like a hipstery thing to say. But it's like, man, I, I knew this. I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. That's why I had them on the show. And then, boom, happened with Maddie. Uh, my very good friend Katrina Davis out in LA happening with her right now. Like it happens so often where Dan, obviously Lamort, it's been happening oh, with. Yeah. It's like one of those What's things deserved? where it's like, yeah, you get them on Steven Rogers, Caitlin Plouffe, Ian Laura, you like, it's so cool to have these people on who are so good at comedy. And I can see that. Like I watch them and I go, I really like what, the, what's happening here. And then I get them on. And then people kind of get a behind the scenes. And then when something happens, everyone's like, who's this? And I'm like, actually, you want to yeah. listen to this episode? I'll tell you exactly who this person is. <laughs> so, Maddie, we had the same thing. And Dope. it's just, it's so exciting to see. As soon as she got off stage, I was like, yeah, I know this is weird because I only know you a month, but I, can I hug you? Like, that was freaking awesome. I did the I'm same. I'm so happy <laughs> for you. I saw her like the, the because we moved to New York in the same month. Yeah. Obviously, different things. And I went to the stand one night. And this is when she wasn't even getting like she had just moved here for just like after just for laughs. Yeah. So they were putting her up for like guest spots, but she wasn't like passed yet or she wasn't like because it was literally like right when she got here. And I saw her and I, I ran out of the room when she got off and I was like, hey, you're not on the lineup. Like, what is your social media? Like, what is all your like? You, that was awesome. Like, I need to follow you on everything. Hell yeah. And the same thing. And then we became friends and she's done the show. And now we're like we're like good friends now. But it's. It's so awesome to see because it's one of those things like, and just like you for this is not happening. Like 
you're unrepped, you're unknown, but you're like, I, I know what I'm like, I got it. Like, trust me. And then you get on there and it's got what? A few, it's got millions of views. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so I think the first one's at like three and a half, and uh, the second season one is at like four million views. That's yeah. crazy. It is trippy. Like, you, I got off the stage. And like I, you know, like I walk into like the backstage green room area in the parking lot, and uh, I was like in a daze. Like yeah. the producer comes up to me. That's when I finally felt nervous. Like I felt like I can't do anything. Much. This was the first time where you're like, oh, it doesn't mean any. Like I'm just doing it for me. This is the first time where you're like, ah, shit. Yeah, and wow. it, like it, it just because it tripped me out. Like oh, this could be a thing, you know. Um. So yeah, and I, I uh, incredibly thankful to all the people involved over there. I, I uh, always give props to Ari, to Sam, to Eric. Uh, they all like worked on that show. That's brilliant. Um, shame it's not there no more. You know, hopefully I get in a position one day to bring in a storytelling show again. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of that format. Yeah, and, me uh, too. I think it's done a lot for uh, myself and other comics. You know, Ali Sadiq, I think blows up. Yeah, to the level he's at now because of a show like that. So. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, super blessed that I got that opportunity early on. That's awesome. I wanted to ask you, before we get into the stories, because we're going to go back in time to when you were younger and get into some of these stories. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you about the PBS thing, because this is something you and I have talked about a lot. This is after This Is Not Happening, right? Yeah, yeah. This is around my album release. Okay, so you're coming out with the... Oh, yeah. Did you plug the album? Oh, yeah. No, um, I have an album out. It's called uh, Immigrant Made. You can hear it on most uh, streaming services. And if you want to see the independently released like shot special that I did, it's on Amazon Prime. You got it on Amazon Prime? Yeah, I was one of the first people to do that. That's how I got... Real talk, like... How did you... So... I did like this is this is the advantage to being an adult with like marketing and sales in your background. So not only that, but like a little bit of disposable income. People yeah. ask me all this, and they're like, "How do you do that?" Pot? I go, "You just throw money at it, dude." I, yeah, straight up. Like I planned the whole thing out. So like the first this is happening, um, this is not happening clip comes out, and um, Comedy Central Films their shit comes out six months. A year later. You said it was it was supposed to be two years, but then right. they got you in in the year. Right. So the first one comes out a year later, and I get a ton of pop in the visibility. People follow me, but, like, I got nowhere to send them. I got no podcast. I got no album. So, like, I realized, like, I wasted that moment. Yeah. So I get booked on the next season, and they doubled the season's uh, length. So, like, they recorded double the episodes. They announced that the, the show's getting canceled. So we get an email telling half of us that, hey, listen, uh... They're going to split the season back to the previous size. And because of that, half of you are going to come out a year after. Okay. So instead of so instead uh, of doing one long season, it's going to be two regular right. seasons. And instead of waiting uh, a year for uh, for uh, all the episodes, half of you are going to wait almost two years. That's the, the one release. that you told me about. Yeah. Right. So everyone else in the email is like, oh, that sucks. I'm hyped because now I know I got two years to plan for this moment yeah. that I wasted the first time. So I start sending emails out to like record labels like, yo, uh, I got a This Is Not Happening clip in the back coming out in two years to the week, I could tell you. The last one I put out got a million views. If this is going to come out, get that same attention. I want to record an album release it for that week. I get a ton of responses. I pick a label that I worked well with. We did that. Then I sent so, that email to like a bunch of people like PBS, and I started booking a bunch of stuff. Okay. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Be because you have that this is not happening, that's kind of the card the, the card in your back pocket. So the labels reach back out to you, and they're like, oh, my God. Like, And so do you take meetings with all these people and stuff? And like, yeah. Because that's the thing with comedy is that until you have something – I mean, it's the thing with art. Until you have something that can benefit them, they're kind of like, eh, fuck off. Yeah, um, you, I mean, you have to be real. Like, yeah. There are, I don't even know about LA. I don't live out there like that. There has to be legitimately 15,000 people in New York that can give you a hot 15. Yeah. Like, I'm not, and, and it sounds crazy. No, I don't the think market I'm exaggerating. It's so oversaturated. Yeah. yeah. There's, you have to be give that. them a reason. Yeah. So, like, what separates you, right? Like, if they record your album and put it out, what's going to be different about you that they're not doing all the legwork and to get a stream? And this goes all the way back to what we talked about before. This is why having the podcast is so vital. Yeah. Because. I can show them my numbers. I can show them where 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 it works, where it doesn't work. There's and, a demand for you. Yeah, and also it's something tangible. Yeah. Like if you just have social media and you're just putting out clips, admittedly a lot of people put them out before they're ready, and you're just that's what you're doing. Yeah, you'll get a ton of followers, and that's probably that's a, not not probably that's obviously a good thing. But it's like, but you don't have anything that you can like 
like offer right. other than the the set like at least with the podcast it's tangible so i can be like hey i've got this show it gets this many views which already puts us separate from thousands of other comics who just decided not to do it yeah because we already have something different so you do you send out all the res- you get all the responses from the labels you decide to have the album and then the pbs thing happens so yeah. you said they reach out to you yeah they reached out to me um um the there was a couple of different producers on that squad that uh were scouting for stories in new york they saw me crush it at a couple of shows and uh they hit me up with the themes that they were going to be recording for um and i said i'm into it um admittedly like i again like acts like when's the release of this um and i purposely picked the theme that was going to land um for around the album time and then i made sure that i had a story that fit that theme um and yeah so smart and that's the thing is like you said with your background and like sales and stuff like and that's just something growing up that you and i understand it's like well i and i totally get when companies like well what can you do for me yeah and that's makes it makes total logical sense i'm not even mad at it i get i i I genuinely get confused by comics that are like it should be about who's funniest i'm like everyone's funny yeah like i say that all the time on the (laughs) show so many everyone's funny funny. b like that that's not the the separator anymore like and like real talk like if you are a network right you're a tv network every episode costs low end two million dollars to produce paying talent, writers, promoting it, all of that. So you have to understand that, like, networks, they don't know uh, who's funnier. Yeah. They genuinely don't. That's why you see pilots getting Thousands um, of pilots get made a year. Yeah, like, they they, they literally uh, pay people to write them. Then they pay a group of those to film them. Then they pay a group of those for a season. And even from all of that, you end up with, like, one show that makes it through and makes it through. I know a few friends in L.A. who no one's ever heard of. They've done, like, seven, eight, ten pilots. Yeah. It, it just, like done them, like recorded the whole deal, and talented people who yeah. just like it didn't land right, or it, or the other group of people wasn't the right combination to lead to this being a good product. So they don't know how to make it. They just know that that's why they wear suits. <clears throat> but fair and and like being real, they know how to do other stuff. Yeah, like oh yeah, giving them credit. Yeah, it's just that's the one thing they haven't figured well, out. Nobody can. That's right, why. and that's the thing. I, I tell people all the time, and I'm sure you would completely agree with this, where it's like, if you think your stuff is that good, then do it your fucking self. Yeah, put it out. Yeah, like what what, what people do with their albums, people do it on YouTube with their specials. I, I'm doing it now with the one-man show. It's like, I really want to tell this story, and I think it's important. So you know what I did? I shut the fuck up. And I put, put it money out. where my mouth is, <laughs> and now I, I have a, a one-man show coming out. And that that's what I'm getting at. Like I feel like not enough artists... Comics in particular, but artists in general don't realize that, like, when the network looks at you, it's not just about you being talented. They're saying, if I give you $30 million, will you give me 10 episodes on time? Yeah. Like, it's an arrangement. Like, the funny part, they're hoping you're right on that, you know, and they'll get it right enough times that it's worth this gamble. But the responsibility part, the execution part, that's what we can do to separate. So yeah. don't complain about that. Just they're do literally it. telling you the goal. So how did the end? Amazon Prime thing happened. You so Amazon Prime had just like started allowing people to upload specials, and nobody had done it. Like, look it up. I was when when I when my album came out, there were so few specials on Amazon that people thought Amazon bought my special. Yeah, that's what I would like, assume. Yeah, I got press like, yo, gas or special uh, Amazon Prime exclusive, you know, and that wasn't exclusive. the case. It's just I I. <laughs> I, but I thought it over. Like I was like, if I put my special on YouTube, which at the time, ironically, it's flipped. Um, yeah, because YouTube's felt, the thing. Now, now YouTube's the thing. At the time, it meant like, oh, this is a lesser product. I knew that people watching it on Amazon, it would give the illusion of this is a professional, a professional yeah. thing. And I looked it up, and it's the same process. It's just admittedly far more tedious. Someone literally reviews it and approves the upload, whereas YouTube just lets everything yeah. fly. And then if it gets flagged, then they'll come back and they'll take it off. Yeah. yeah. So like, I made sure I met all the metrics. I submitted early to give them time. I still had a hiccup. Like, uh, it took like an extra week from when I announced. So like, the audio was out first, but I was adamant that I knew my stuff was perfectly done, and I put it up, and I got a ton of press from people. 
because it was a rarity to have a special on Amazon that uh, wasn't attached to Amazon. Yeah. It was just someone uploading That's it. That's awesome. You know, so again, like I looked at uh, ways that like, how can I get attention for this project is different. Um, and the other thing was like, admittedly, I felt that the special, I wanted people to watch it the way I watched the special in the living room. Yeah. And I knew that Amazon Prime would uh, people would be more inclined to use oh, a fire yeah. stick. Watch it's it so on the weird TV. that like YouTube, you can watch it on the TV. Like sometimes I'll put on my podcast and I'll joke with my girlfriend, and be like, "Look, I'm on the TV." Yeah, um, <laughs> and you can do that with YouTube, you especially can. now with smart TVs. But back then, you would need watch it on like your on the phone, phone or computer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like it wasn't that I was against that. It's just I wanted to uh, create in the uh, the uh, idea of this is a different product. Yeah, this isn't a YouTube clip. And in turn, I think it got me press. Um, I think less people watched it, but more people talked about it because of it. Um, so I got a shit ton of press, and then a ton of clubs reached out and said, "Hey, you're past." <laughs> and no uh, audition or any, you like, know, no well, audition I, I or say any no that, anything because you did a lot to get there. Right, yeah. I did real work. It's just yeah. I didn't do the 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 work that um, most people take. I didn't do Which that. Which is path. so refreshing because. With styles like yours and styles like mine, it's like, I'm not going to, like, you're going to give me five minutes at an audition. Like, that's not what we're doing. Like, I mean, I can do it, but that's not like kind of like what we're, like, I'm going for. Right, right. And, like, I know you're the same way where it's like, I, I can do, crush five minutes. Yeah, but, like, I'd rather do, like, longer sets. And if you're not going to give me that opportunity, then it's, I think, I think people lose something in that. Yeah. Which is, like, the whole five minute thing in New York where it's, like, five minutes, bang, bang, bang. It's like, yeah. But my stuff is better if it like can breathe a little bit. But they're like, no, it's not how New York does it. But for you, it was easy. Like not easy, but for you, it was one of those things where once you add all that stuff out, they were just like, actually, yeah, come on in. You're you're good. And it's not just the me thing. There's other comics that have like, oh yeah, you know, done the work, and then they they know that oh, this person's good. You know, um, and I don't blame the clubs for that either. Like they have to have a way of knowing that a comic is able to handle a variety of things. The audition is just a tryout to see if you can handle it. If yeah. you have past experience where you show you can handle it already, then there's no need for it. You're good, exactly. It's just like it's just like when uh, just like sports. It's exactly the same thing where it's like, yeah, you have to try out, but if we followed your career all through college, then we're just going to draft you. Like you don't need to try out. Like it's fine. Amen. So, yeah, like I realized that like as long as I I had a product out that was proof that a uh, I was good. Proof of concept. You know, like I won. So, yeah, I put my focus on that. It thankfully paid off. And, you know, I'm in a good place now. Beautiful. You know what I mean? My kids eat steak every day. Yeah. Chilling. You know what I mean? We good money. I wanted to talk to you about growing up in Brooklyn. When, because you sent me a few stories that I want to get into now. When was the first time that you started, like, drinking and hanging out and, like, doing that? Was that? (laughs) The first, so. I drank the first time when I was 13, and then I didn't drink again until the day my daughter was born. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I uh, I got what happened at 13. I got very drunk unintentionally at my one of my junior high like end of the year parties. Dances, oh parties, yeah. Like somebody was throwing a house like. All of my friends decided to throw a house party every other week for like May and June because we were graduating Um, from junior high. From junior high, so like. At one of these parties, my home, it was at my homegirl's Crystal's crib. Somebody spiked the punch. I didn't know. You had no idea. And no you like idea. punch. Like, genuine. I just like You're juice. Just like, I'm like, I like juice. You know what I mean? I drank mad juice. And I know, like, I was acting a fool that day. And I don't remember much of the day. And then the <laughs> next day, everyone called me saying, yo, G, you was wildin'. Yo, you was crazy. And, like, they were excited for me. And I don't remember the fun of it. And I like having fun. Yeah. So I was like, why? Like, all the fun shit. You, could, so could you really not piece together what happened? I saw, like, flashes of it when people told me, yo, you did this. And I was like, oh, yeah, I That's do remember That's terrifying. That. Yeah. Like, I drank a lot that day. Because uh, thinking of it from the perspective of when we're older and we drink, it's like, oh, we could black out. But we know what we're, like, we're drinking. We're drinking this drink. That's got to be so scary to not know. And I mean, I know we hear about it, obviously, a lot on the news with like um, Rufalin and stuff like that, where like just to be drinking a drink and then and I've actually had a guest on before who got roofied one time. Yeah. And it was almost by accident because this they they were at a bar, him and his girlfriend and his girlfriend's mom and the bartender tried to spike the girlfriend's mom's drink and he drank it instead. And he like got like was like totally fucked. 
like literally physically like couldn't move like and all this stuff and he was explaining it to me and it obviously with you explaining it now at 13 it's a little less like you know volatile it's a little less like dark but it's still like to be 13 and think i'm just drinking juice like i like juice and yeah. then like waking up the next day out of a blackout like hung over that's terrifying like i i genuinely do not remember ever being told it was spiked during the party God. like at all so and you i had no recollection yeah, of like, what happened so like then people would tell me stuff and like i kind of remember yeah, that hazy, doing stuff yeah. like oh yeah i did do that like uh my and I, I was me and my friend raced down the block while carrying one of the girls from our class. You won. I don't remember. I know. I, I know who I carried. I carried Dafina, and like we ran half a block carrying a young lady each to see who could like run faster with this added weight. Yeah. I don't know why that was a good idea. Maybe thirteen, but it yeah, it worked. You know, but uh, yeah, like I. I, and then we had more parties, and like, admittedly, like, I didn't want the. You just steered away from it. Yeah, like yeah. it just it didn't feel like cool to me that like we had a great time, and I didn't remember it. Yeah, you know, I didn't, and I didn't have the other stuff. I didn't, I wasn't nauseous the next day. I didn't have a hangover. Okay, I felt that fine. was my next question. Yeah, yeah, like so, like all of that was cool with me. I was like, it's just, I'm like, this sucks that like everyone else is telling me how yeah. dope this night was, and I don't remember it. I want to remember. That's the whole point of these parties. Yeah. Like, that we're That's not going to we see go. each other yeah. anymore. And I'm missing the whole thing, you know? So, like, I, I stopped. And uh, to reinforce it, uh, at the next party at my homegirl uh, Joanne's house, someone spilled alcohol on me. And the parents came home. And I got in trouble. For, what? And I didn't drink. So, I was angry. I'm like, yo, this shit sucks. Like, now I'm getting, like, looked at funny. So, like... The next four parties, when people were making the list, they would have to tell me, hey, I don't know if you could come because Joanne's mom talked to my mom. And I'm like, I wasn't even drinking, bro. Like, and, I, and they were like, yeah, I know. But like, people saw how you were acting the first party. Then the second party, you smelled like the drink. And like, it started so now you got a, a problem. story. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'm like, that's not me. I didn't choose to drink the first party. I purposely didn't drink the yeah. second party. Um, So much so that like three years ago. Um, I apologized to her mom on Facebook. I was like, hey, listen, uh, this, like, I'm 38 years old. I'm 35 years old. Uh, I'm reaching out to you now because I feel like as a parent and, uh, adult, I should have credibility. I did not drink that day. And she was like, okay, like, I believe you now. I'm sorry. What? Like, straight up, like, recently, like, I had that moment because it was like, it bothered me that, like, yeah. yo, that was out there. That wasn't the thing. But, uh, yeah, I literally stopped drinking completely because of that. I would go to parties and, like, I'd have a good time. How old were you when your daughter was born? Um, 25, and that's okay, why. So, like, 12 so, years you went. Yeah, and um, I had a drink at the at the actual uh, hospital. Like, oh. we went downstairs. My boys bought me some drinks and cigars. Yeah. And we did it in front of the hospital in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn on 7th Ave. Hell, yeah. Hell, yeah. And ever since then, you know, like, I felt like, okay, like, um, I enjoyed the drink, and uh, it wasn't, like, an out-of-control thing. And since then, I've drank, and I still drink. It's just I don't drink often. Yeah. I probably have, like, realistically, like, I probably drink, like, 10, 12 times a year. Yeah, and when you, because I've been around you a lot, like, at the stand and stuff, and you, you're very responsible, which, I mean, sounds crazy. You're like, yeah, I'm, you know, 38 years old, of course, and I've got kids, and I own a building. But you, the listeners, you guys would be shocked how irresponsible a lot of people are <laughs> and, and are. Whether yeah. it's actors, musicians, comics. And we were talking about this before. I was telling you about the timing and the recording and stuff. And you go, yeah, like I own a building. I have kids. Like it's timing is important. Yeah. I got shit to do. People yeah. depend on me to get it done. Exactly. And I'm like, you'd be shocked how many comics are like, yeah, I'll get there when I get there. And I'm nah. like, hey, man, you know, I paid for an hour, right? Like that's we get the hour. And they're like, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And I'm like, that's not how this works. At all. <laughs> Yeah, nah. Build, buildings in uh, on Forty Second Street don't deal with that energy. Yeah, they <laughs> they are very scheduled, including the checks they get from you. Yeah, nah, be I'm I'm big on like uh, being on point with your stuff. Um, yeah, like I feel like there's a time and place for that energy, but it's not with appointments. It's not with business. It's yeah, because you can still definitely let loose and have a good time. Yeah, chill like, out. There's, yeah, there's for a sure. difference. Yeah, but that's not the place. Like, um, case in point, like when we got club spots, I'm big on being early. Um, relaxed. I'm there to I'm there to be available for the club to do business. They're doing me 
the service of giving me a place to work on my craft where I get paid. I, we get paid to practice at yeah. comedy clubs in New York. That's insane if yeah. you think about it. Like, yo, come here, work on your craft. I'm going to pay you. Um, work on it so much that you are you aren't available to us because you'll be leaving so, to get more yeah, money on the road. So like much, yeah. you, like the whole concept of that is crazy. Back come yeah. here, practice so that you can't be available to come make us money. And it's also to good go too elsewhere. because, again, going back to that, how you are responsible. It's one of those things where it's like we've talked about that where you're like, yeah, I'll I try new stuff during the week, but on the weekends when people hire babysitters and stuff, I bring the heat. Like it's time to go. Yeah, and. And the club appreciates that because they're like, okay, you can work on your stuff whenever you want, whenever you want. They'll never tell you not to. But you in your head understand, like, this is when we have to go. Like, this yeah. is when it's time to go. Yeah, there's an economy involved here. Like, um, I always think about, like, yo, if you had a comedy club Monday through Thursday, yeah, I know there's variables. But realistically, you're more prone to be a big comedy fan. Like, you came right after work. You came on an off day because the show's a little weird. It's interesting. Well, and so, a lot of touring comics are in the city Monday through Thursday. Exactly. So a lot of times you're fans of specific people who are on the show. Yeah. Which is so, why you come out. You're a fan of comedy. You're a fan of comedy. So, like, I'm, I feel more comfortable gambling because you're someone that understands there's a process. You've probably heard about what we do. You're okay with, like, me gambling. Um, that's part of what you're probably interested in. Yeah. Whereas um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like, I have – genuinely close friends that know I do this for a living and I know for a fact they will die at 80 and see maybe three comedy shows their whole life their whole life their whole life like and I and one of them was like my album recording yeah. like they're that they and they and they don't un, like they will never like uh know you specifically as comics unless you're literally Kevin Hart yep. so to them it's I went to that comedy club and that comedy club is the brand that represents all of comedy for them. So, like, when you hear about people saying, oh, I don't go to comedy clubs, it's because the one time they went, they, they had, had a it. shitty yep. experience. Yep. Somebody chewed them out that shouldn't have because they, they were terrible at Comic crowd work. on stage, wasted. Somebody, like, exactly. Yeah. Someone's unprofessional, does it wrong. And you just ruined, like, that person and now probably that couple, that couple and their friends. Like, you just lost their people kids, from the whole thing, world because yeah. of you. You know what I mean? So like, yo, you messing up you our money. Because I say that all the time too. It's like you get one opportunity. Yeah. Like that's it. You messing up the whole situation for us. You call somebody out and then you go too hard because you don't understand the like the tension that's in the room, or you're like, fuck it, this is my house. Like I'll do what I want. And then they cry. Then other people see you make that person cry, and it's like, oh, we don't want to go see this ever again. Yeah. You ruined the, that person for uh, our art and like they're gonna spread that word and like everyone around them that whole ecosystem they're gone from comedy because like they can't even bring it up like if it's your your sister your mom and you're like yo let's have a, a fun night out yo let's go to comedy she'll shut that down you Instantly. lost the whole squad of people yeah because of your like silly frivolous idea of i could be free and say what i want on the weekend do that monday through thursday your shit do it at your show but like the comedy club, somebody pay thirty dollars to drink minimum. Be a professional, and a babysitter, do and yeah. a ride sharing. That's yeah. a three hundred dollar night. Like yeah. you fucking it up, yo. Like don't don't do that. It, it, it annoys me when I see that energy like over somebody. I get so tight too when like someone like automatically chews out an audience member. That, I like, get so something. yeah. I'm like, I'm like come on now. That person's excited. Like, channel that energy. Yes, it's not right that they talk, but overall, all that person is saying is, I'm so happy to be here. I, wanted, I don't I know wanted, what to do. Yeah. I want to be a part of it. Yeah. What What's the right interaction? Train them yeah. so that they enjoy the moment and they enjoy the show and they might come back. Yeah. Crazy idea. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yo. I wanted to ask you, speaking of training and being responsible, you had a, a policy that you had to implement in your 20s. <laughs> Yeah. So what happened with it? So are you? You're not drinking at the time when this happened. I am not. I am not. Uh, How me, old are you when this happened? Uh, what is this? I would say I'm like 26. Okay. Yeah. Me, my boys from high school, we would get together often. Uh, my boys from Beta. Um, so one of my boys is having a birthday party in the city, and it just so happened to land on one of our other friends from high school who had moved to Florida was coming up to visit. Okay. So he comes up. I tell him, hey, yo, this is perfect. The crew's getting together. Um, you haven't seen them in years. Come through, I'll dr and, I'll, and I'll take you to the party. And he's like, damn, that means I got to go straight to your crib from the from the airport. I'm like, don't worry about it. Come to my crib. Drop your shit off at my house. We'll go to the air. We'll go to the party. And then 
uh, I'll drop you off at your fam's house later. He said, cool. So he shows up. We go to the party. That's always how it starts. Cool. Yo, it sounded peace. I yeah. pick up my girl. I take my boy Jeff with me. You know what I mean? And we show up to the party, and we having a blast. I lose him like 30 minutes in. And like every now and then I would see him like in the corner getting drunk, getting wild. But it was like just controlled enough that I'm like, all right, that's peace. And also <laughs> everyone else like knows him. So like. Yeah, so no one's getting in like in trouble. Yeah, right? like I'm like, he can't get in that much trouble. Like everyone rocks with him here. Everyone's excited. We haven't seen him in four years. So like I would see him. I'm like, all right, like you probably shouldn't be on that table. But like I'm gonna let that go. I know this is a it's you you excited you cool. I'm gonna let that vibe. So like we in there like an hour and my boy Drake comes up to me and he's like, "Yo, uh, G, uh, and I, I ain't trying. I'm trying to avoid saying homie's name, yeah. you know. So he's like, "Yo, uh, he hit on he hit on our people's girl." Um, and I'm like, "Yo, but that's his people's too." He hit on my boy Phil's girl and I'm like, uh. Yo, but he knows that Phil's with her. He's like, yeah, I don't think he understands that right now because he's like, so out of his mind. He's so out of it. Uh, so you should go talk to him. So I'm like, all right, cool. Where's he at? And he's like, he's upstairs. So I go upstairs. I can't find him. I come downstairs. I can't find him. And they're like, yo, um, uh, uh, the people at, from the from the bar they want to talk uh, to us because apparently he's in the bathroom like yelling. And I'm like, what and are you talking about? This is the bar downstairs? So, like, this, the bar's upstairs. The party's downstairs, part of the bar. And, like, the people from the so bar. So, this isn't at a house. This is at, this like, is a bar. at a location okay. in the city. Okay. So, like, the dudes from the bar, they came downstairs to talk to us because apparently he went upstairs. And the reason I couldn't find him is because he went into the upstairs bathroom. And I, uh, Dre thought he was there to, like, relax. But, like, like apparently yeah. he started yelling while he was in there. And when they opened the door, he, like, broke a mirror and, like, had knocked over the, like, the the sink. Like, hard now the, shit to the, break. The table seems like the least of our yeah, worries. Yeah, like, now. I don't care about you standing on the table. So I go upstairs and, like, my girl who, like, now's my wife, but, like, we're, like, a year into dating. I'm yeah. introducing her to my good friend. <laughs> That like, you know, she's like, what the fuck is wrong with your peoples, you know? So like, <laughs> none of this is going well for me, you know what I mean? Like, I hyped this dude up. Like, yo, I'm, yo, this is my homie. Like, I'm just, haven't seen him. Yo, yeah. I'm so hyped. You're going to love him. And like, she's like, yo, your dude's like hitting on girls that's going out with your people. Whoa. She's breaking shit in the bathroom. So like, she starts talking with the, with the people from the bar to like, yo, I'm sorry about what happened. He's a little old drunk, whatever. Um, There's a lot try, of drunk. Right. And she's trying to calm him yeah. down. And I see her like struggling with that interaction because they're legitimately mad, mad. Yeah. And honestly, as much as she's trying to keep the peace, she don't give a fuck about my boy like that. Like, yeah. So she's like not that motivated. She's doing me a favor. Exactly. But like she's losing and like I'm seeing her lose. So like she's kind of like, ah, whatever. Yeah. She's like, he does deserve this shit. Yeah. You know, so like I go over to try to fix it. And I let him go. He goes back downstairs. While I'm talking with the bar people, he goes back and hits on homeboy's girl again. So my boy Dre drags him upstairs, comes up to me. He's like, Gas, so you got to leave now. Phil saw uh, uh, such and such hitting on his girl. He's going to fuck him up if you don't leave right this moment. So I'm like, all right, cool. So, like, where is he? And, like, Dre had let him go. To tell me like this, drag him up and right, let him go, dragged yeah. him upstairs, but let him go to tell me this privately, not in front of him, yeah, so that he doesn't know that we're about to leave. He goes back in the bathroom, breaks more shit. Oh god! So like, my girl is like, I don't know what to do. Like, I can't fix that. So like, we look at him, we grab him, we leave, and we start walking towards the car. All the bar people noticed that more shit got broke. The entire, like, bar staff starts walking towards us outside. And, like, my man looks at them, and I'm like, yo, bro, we got to go. Like, we're going to get into a real fight now. And, yeah. like, I know it's, like, four on four, but one of them is, like, my 95-pound girlfriend. You are extremely Yeah, you're inebriated. useless, yeah. Yeah, like, I, this isn't a fair fight right now. Like, I ain't about this. And he, like, gets hyped. He's like, nah, B, <laughs> I don't care. I take on all these motherfuckers. He's, like, 5'4", by the way. <laughs> Like, he's not the guy for this, you know what I mean? I'm not saying, he ain't, it's not that he ain't tough, it's just, you're going to no, lose. No, yeah, yeah. You're going to lose this fight, bro. There's physics involved. Yeah, like, so he's like, nah, B, I got this. And he starts, like, 
stripping as if that helps in the fight. I never understood that when people – like, I mean, I get it, I guess, so people can't grab your shirt and stuff, but, like – But, like, the thing is, that makes sense the way, like, people normally dress now. Yeah. This is, like, early 2000s hip-hop era. Like, you need that belt. Yeah. Like, your pants is, like, 4XL. <laughs> Okay, don't take that, that off. Jeans, yeah, baby. like you need that shit. So like he takes off his belt, he whips it. I see his sidekick fly somewhere into the street. He takes off his hat. He takes off four shirts. Like he's just like and he's like, let's do this, let's do this. And then collapses on the floor. <laughs> Completely like gone. You know? And like the dudes like run up on him and I'm like, hey, oh my man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What's what's the damage? And they're like, yo, like he broke this, this, and this. And I'm like, I'll give you $100. Does that, like, cover it? He's like, nah, that's not enough. And I'm like, that's all I got. But, like, sincerely, you can have it. I'm sorry. He says, cool. I give him the 100 bucks. They go over there. And uh, I'm starting to get, like, my phone's jumping. Like, I look at the phone. It's Dre. He's like, yo, you have to leave. Phil is outside looking for him. He's going to jump. Damn, him. so he's about to get jumped again. Exactly. So, like, now he's, he's, he's I'm like, he's, he's done. He's like, he's dead. Uh, my boy Jeff would come with me. He's one of my, like, friends from my hood. Doesn't know this kid from high school. Yeah. Right? But he sees the situation. He works at bars. So he's, like, used to people being drunk. So he, like, picks him up and starts dragging him to the car. And it's like, he's, like, off, man. Like, he's just not responding at all. Like, he's yeah. not moving. We get to my car. I'm parked at the corner. And, like, Jeff is exhausted. Drops him on the floor. And, like. I look at Jeff and I'm like, yo, like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? He's like, you got to take him to his house. I'm like, I don't know where he lives. He lives in Florida now. He doesn't live here anymore. His family is his cousins. I've never been yeah. to his cousin's crib. He left his bags in my house, but like, I don't know where to take him. He's like, why don't you call his family? He just threw his fucking phone away. I don't yeah. know. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to contact anybody. Like, I don't know what the fuck to do. Um, so he's like, you got to take him to your house. Let him sober up. I'm like, I'm not taking this drunk dude to my house because then my mom and dad are going to think that I chill with drunk people all yeah. the time. It's going to be 13 yeah, like, all over again. On me. Yeah, like I don't want any of that energy on me. I don't do all this over shit. Again. Yeah, I'm like, I don't do this shit. You know, so he like, he's like, yo, I've dude. I've been fighting this stigma for 20 years. Yeah, I'm like, I, didn't, I don't do this, B. Like, I purposely don't drink. Don't put this on me. And he's like, bro, like the bar I work at is in the city. If you leave a drunk dude. And this, and this is like on first and third. Like this is the okay. the city. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, yo, you leave a drunk dude here, it won't be more than a half hour before the cops come and pick him up. Like you have to take him home. So like as a perp like as a point to prove that he was so drunk that he wasn't awake. Like we were at the corner by one of the uh the like circular things where people like tie their bikes at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bike, yeah. And like there was a bike there. I literally put the t the the thread of the tire on his face, turned it. And it did nothing to him. He, he didn't, didn't wake didn't up. up. He didn't move. So I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what to do with this kid. And he's like, yo, uh, we have to take him. So he, I'm like, I right, listen, if you could get him in my car, I'll take him wherever. But I'm not loading that drunk dude in my car yeah. on principle. So he's like, fine. My girl sits in front with me. I drive. Jeff drags him through the back seat and sits with him with his head on his lap like he just knows this guy. <laughs> right? And we're driving back to Brooklyn. I'm heated. <laughs> doesn't know. The best part is the mental image doesn't know him at all. But he's like, that's all right. It's all right. Be like, is that, yeah. is that, it is what yeah, it is, you, you know? Right. So, like, we're driving and, like, and halfway. Now you said you're driving back to Brooklyn? Right. We're driving back to Brooklyn. And um, we're in my dad's car. And oh, he no. starts to hurl. Like, he just throws up. Just, like, comes out of the blackout yeah. and starts throwing up. Throws up all over Jeff, all over the seats, all over the floor in the back. And, like. What do you do as you're driving? Do you like slam on the brakes? I'm pissed or you, like, off, but scream? I'm on the highway. I'm yeah. on the jackie. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? And like, I'm telling him like, and, and like, there comes a point where like, you nothing you say makes sense anymore because it's too far. Like, yeah. put your head out the window. Why? Like, you already now did a gallon. Yeah. Like, it is what it is. Yeah. So I'm like fuming, and I'm like, I'm not taking this dude to my house. I don't care what you say. And I'm like, Je and Jeff is like, you have to take him to the house. I'm like, I take can never. I can't even picture it because you're so you're such a sweetheart. I it's. So interesting, like I could, because I could see the energy you're getting. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, you get, you got like mad. No, like, I was big. Heated. Like I'm holding back so yeah. much right now, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, yo, my man, like I'm not taking him to my house. I can't have a drunk dude in my house that I, I don't, I don't deserve. I don't chill with drunk people. I don't drink. This yeah. dude just yacked in my car. He don't deserve that. And I'm like, 
And Jeff's like, you have to take him. I'm like, you take him. I'm like, and Jeff Vadler, he's like, I don't know him. I'm like, I just met the dude today. Yeah. And I, and then he's you like. You take him. Yeah. And then he's like, uh, he tells my girl, he's like, Gabby, why don't you take him to your crib? And Gabby's like, I got five siblings. My dad's a deacon. I'm not showing up on the one date night I had this month with my boyfriend with a drunk guy that he went to high school with. No, that's not the story I'm giving my dad today. So <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, valid, like, response. Yeah. Once, you know, so like I'm like I'm like yo, bro. On principle, I promise you, he will not enter my house. And Jeff is like, and I have a huge yard. My parents have a dope yard. He's like, why don't you leave him in the yard? I'm like, no, my parents' yard don't deserve yak on it yeah. like my car has right now. Well, not only that, but God forbid your parents wake up before you do and they call the cops. Yeah, all is, of this. We're all in the same. We're in the same position we were to start, bro. So like, Jeff is like, uh, what are we gonna do? I was like, that's a good idea though. He should be outside. And Jeff said, I'm like, let's leave that dude outside. And I'm like, we no longer in the city. Nobody will arrest him. Where can we leave him outside that it won't be a problem? He's like, honestly, take him to St. Mike's. Take him to the church and just leave him take on him the steps. Take him to the church. Straight up. And we went to St. Michael's Church, uh, Jerome Street. Freaking put him right on the steps with other homeless people. And that dude, like, he just, he was he stayed sleeping. I got to my house. And, like, I'm angry, like, infuriated Fuming, after yeah. dropping everyone off. And from 6 a.m. till about maybe like 11.30, I'm in the backyard trying to clean out yak from this car. Yeah. My dad wakes up. He's an early bird. He sees me cleaning. And, like, my dad is high temper energy. Like, I, I the reason I'm not normally angry is because I don't like what I saw when yeah. he gets angry. So I try to avoid that. He shows up. I know he's going to get mad. He's going to lose it. But I'm so mad that, like, I'm mad for him. Like, he's like, what the hell happened? I was like, I'm going to tell you what the fuck happened, okay? <laughs> I'm chill with, with my mans. He got drunk. He threw up in the car. Jeff made me take him, dad. He made me take him. It's some bullshit. Now I got to clean this shit? You believe it? Then I had to tell you about it? It ain't fair, B. Now I'm going to get in trouble with you for something that I didn't do. It's stupid. Yo, don't even talk to me right now. You know what I mean? I'll deal with you later. I'm angry enough about this right now. I got to clean this. And like... He knew. He saw that I was so heated that like he just left it alone. Wow. Like, he was like, I right, like clearly like it's I've fucking had, with him. I've had people on this show before where they like I was like, oh, did you get in trouble? And they always are. It's like the same thing. It's like, well, yeah, eventually like something happened, but the person in the moment could tell I was so remorseful or so upset or so angry that they were like, yeah, they they already they, they're doing they, it. They already got what I was trying yeah, to do. Like they're yeah. there. Like they get it. So yeah. like I like do. I'm cleaning yet. From another person. Yeah. Like, that's the punishment. I'm good. So, like, I'm cleaning the car. I get it to as close as I can. At, like, 11, he comes over. He's like, like, all right, you got most of it out. I'll take it to the detail. a detailer. Yeah. And, like, he's like, you're fine. So, I go inside. And I lay down after this crazy night about to pass out. At, like, 11.10, I hear, like, some weird knocking on my door that's, like, lethargic. Yeah. And, like, I open it. And it's my boy. And I'm like, what you doing here, man? And he's like, yo, uh, I got a crazy headache. And I'm like, yeah, you drank a lot. He's like, nah, be like the bells from the church. <laughs> like, they rang for like 15 minutes. That's how I woke up. I'm like, yo, my bad. But uh, you deserve that, my G. And he looks at me and he's like, um, can I crash here? I was like, no, like you can't. No. Like, be like, you lost all of that. I don't I don't rock with you right now. I need, I need, I need space for a day or two. And he's like, all right. And, uh. He has to like open up his luggage and like look through it to find a written note with the address of where to go. And he looks at his luggage, packs it up, and he leaves, then comes back 10 minutes later, knocks on my door. He's like, yo, uh, I don't mean to bother you, but like, I know you're mad, um, but I need uh, $2.25 because uh, I the- threw my wallet away and I don't got Metro card money. So I had to give this dude money for the metro Damn. car. And he left. And that's my dude. Like, to yeah. the, like we chilled every day in high school. And we ch- and we cool now. But there was like a five-year gap where, like, we ain't talk. Yeah. Because I was and like, And then yo. you made the rule. No one's allowed and to get And then I made the drunk. rule from there on in. Yo, if you if you in my car and you disrespect my car, no, I will kick you out. Yeah. And I had to stick to it. People ain't believe me. Including uh, the first person that got kicked out is the dude that warned me that he was acting up at the party. My yeah. boy Dre. I left him once on a Jackie Robinson. For real? Straight up. I pulled over. He was acting reckless in the back of my car. He's being get distracting. Out. I pulled over between exits. 
was like, yo, my man, get out. And he's like, yo, you being crazy. I'm like, yo, I'm not pulling off. I put the hazards on. I was like, you getting out of my car, walk the fuck home. <laughs> I don't care. Straight up. And I did it twice. I did it one to him. I did it one to my boy. And like, when you do that two times and people, people talk know. about yeah, it, yeah, people's yeah. like, oh, he's for real. So like, no one Damn, like messes man. with my yeah. car now because of it. But yeah, I was like, I just on principle, I can't have people acting up in my car. Oh, man. So, well, so yeah. I appreciate you coming on, man. That was a great story. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. That I'm glad I got the time. vent a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> now, man. Plug everything to everybody <laughs> listening one more time. Your social media, the album, the podcast, the whole thing. Yeah, man. Uh, you catch me on all social medias at Gastron Monte. Uh, my album, Immigrant Made, streams on most of the like streaming things, and it's also on Amazon Prime. And please uh, check out my podcast, The War Report, hosted by myself and the homie Chalet with Sharp. Episodes every week on Thursday. Perfect, bro. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you again, everybody, for listening at Brennan T Comedy on all social media. BrennanTComedy.com. We've got the one-man show coming out in January. And subscribe on Patreon. Get your merch. Gang, we'll talk gang. to y'all next week. Peace. Dude, that was fun, man. <laughs> yeah, that was a blast, man. Thanks for having me, bro. Thanks for coming on. It's-